Good morning, everyone. Good morning, morning. We are officially live streaming on the AWI YouTube channel, where you can also check out previous presentations. So really thank you all for coming out this morning. I know it's a little chilly in here, but I am sure Dr. Jackson will warm it up very soon. And if you didn't know, my name is Dr. Talitha Washington, I'm professor of mathematics here at Clark Atlanta University, director of the AUC Data Science Initiative and president of the awesome Association for Women in Mathematics. So really having a pleasurable weekend with you all, doing math, sharing math, forming new networks, and just hanging out. So really great uh, to see you all and have you all here on our illustrious campus. Uh, and so they told me there's some logistical things that I need to share. So let me make sure we do that. Because I think some people will be departing today. Uh, and there's a group that's leaving at noon, even though you know we go through lunch and we have a community round table, right, where policy meets action. It's gonna be super cool. Um, if you have to leave early, there is a group going down to the airport at noon. Um, so they'll be meeting right outside. Uh, on your table, you have this survey. The Policy and Advocacy Committee wants to know what's important to you so we can best serve your interest and help you be connected. Um, so if you could take a moment to fill out the survey, that would be great. The mail room right across the hall closes at noon. So if there's something that you need to mail, please do that before 12 noon Eastern Standard Time today. Uh, and I think that's it for the announcements. Uh, really just thankful to all the local organizing committee, um, the, the folks who are sitting outside, the students, the CAU TV, got to give them a shout out. They've been here the whole weekend. Our fantastic photographer who's been catching our beautiful faces. <laughs> and it really is it's an orchestrated event that I really, I'm just hanging out, but it's really the organizing committee that's been doing all the work. And thank you to all the plenary speakers, to all the breakout session speakers, the discussion groups, and don't forget the yoga. So that was super cool to add that in. Uh, it's good to have a balance of life, uh, both on the yin and the yang, right? So without further ado, I'm just going to take a moment and introduce our provost here at Clark Land University, who will then introduce um, Dr. Monica Jackson. Um, and so I just let you know that here at uh, Clark Land University, we have a rich tradition in mathematics. When you walk through the promenade, there's a, a building, it's called McFeeter's Dennis. So Dennis, Dr. Dennis, was the 13th African-American to earn a PhD in mathematics. And he was chair of Clark College uh, for many decades, we'll say. Uh, and as you all know, Clark Atlanta University was the coming together of Clark College, which was undergraduate, and Atlanta University, which was graduate. And so they came together to form Clark Atlanta University. We also have a rich legacy. Uh, one of my, my favorite, no, don't tell the other mathematicians, but one of my favorite mathematicians, Dr. Abdullah Lim Shabazz, was here at Clark Atlanta, well, actually at Atlanta University, where he served as chair. And he was a staunch advocate for increasing participation in mathematics. And he was never uh, shy to share how this should be done. So really appreciate the legacy that comes before us. And then I know that you all may have seen Dr. Tarina Lewis here at some point. She was also chair. When I came in in August of 2020, um, she was the one that signed me up and got, me, got my email and all the rest of that. And so Tarina really led, it, it laid a great foundation here uh, in mathematics with us. And our current chair uh, in the mathematics is Dr. Sandra Rucker, who works tirelessly to, to make sure we're all stewarded in the right direction. So I just wanted to pay homage to uh, our, the ones who lead us in, in mathematics here at the illustrious Clark Atlanta University. So our, our provost and senior vice president for academic affairs, Dr. Charlene Gilbert, thank you for taking the time this morning. Uh, and she became the new provost back, back in June 1st, 2023, so just a few months shy. She comes to CAU with over 15 years of administrative experience, including serving as dean for nearly eight years. During her administrative career, Dr. Gilbert has built an impressive track record, focused on increasing first-year graduation rates, 
uh, retention rates, and faculty research. She served as the Dean of the College of Arts and Letters at the University of Toledo for five years, where she was responsible for 14 academic departments, 200 faculty, 1,500 students, and managed a $26 million budget. She also served three years as Dean as one of the Ohio State University's four regional campuses. Fortunately for us, she now is with us and leading us in, in fantastic directions. She's the recipient of several distinguished fellowship awards, including the Bunting Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study Fellowship, the Kellogg National Leadership Fellowship, and Rockefeller Media Arts Fellowship. One of the things that's near and dear to my heart that she actually helped uh, stand up a data science academic program at her institutions. That's, you know, data science. Is, okay. Uh, she earned her bachelor's degree in economics and political science from Yale University, a master's of fine arts degree from Temple University, and a PhD in educational studies from the University of Nebraska. She's a highly accomplished administrator, scholar, and artist who has films, right? She does these really neat films. Check them out. One of them is a PBS documentary entitled Homecoming, Sometimes I Am Haunted by Memories of Red Dirt and Clay. So here in Georgia, we, we have, you know, the, the thing of red dirt and clay. It's, a, it's an interesting phenomenon. Uh, but please check, check out our film. Uh, so Dr. Gilbert, thank you for joining us today uh, to introduce our keynote speaker for the morning. Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Clark Atlanta University, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this morning to our historic campus. Uh, thank you so much for choosing our campus to convene the 2023 Association for Women in Mathematics Research Symposium. I, I am particularly pleased to welcome you all here today for many reasons, including the fact that for the majority of my 25 years in higher education, I've advocated for more women and students of color in STEM disciplines. And throughout that work, Women math faculty have nearly always been at the front of the line, standing shoulder to shoulder with all of us in the academy who are committed to making sure our classrooms and research labs are filled with the mosaic of excellence and talent that can be found all across this country and the world. Thank you for the critical role you have played for the past 50 years in working to increase the presence and visibility of women in mathematical sciences. Today, I'm also so pleased to join you because I have the great wonderful honor of introducing your plenary speaker, Clark Atlanta University alumna, Dr. Monica Jackson, who currently serves as the Deputy Provost and Dean of Faculty at American University, which is also where I was a tenured associate professor many, many years ago. So we, we are just like sharing stories from, from our, our, the ways our paths have crossed. Dr. Jackson began her research career when she was an undergraduate student here at Clark Atlanta University. While here she participated uh, in that experience, which solidified her career goal of becoming a university professor and scholar. Dr. Jackson has served as an, as an associate dean of undergraduate studies in the College of Arts and Letters, Arts and Sciences at American University, and established their first summer program in research and learning for undergraduate students and faculty from across the country. She is also a principal investigator for American University's advanced grant that analyzes gender and racial data and works to increase equity in these areas amongst STEM faculty. Dr. Jackson's current research interest is in the area of spatial statistics and disease surveillance with applications for developing investigating methods for detecting cancer clusters, global clustering patterns, and developing simulation algorithms for spatially correlated data. She has spent sabbaticals at the National Cancer Institute the Institute for Pure and Applied Mathematics at UCLA, and the Statistical and Applied Mathematical Science Institute, where she worked on applying her spatial techniques to a wide variety of medical problems. She has won numerous awards for her scholarship and service. Those include the Frederick Douglass Distinguished Scholars Faculty Fellow, the Delta Kappa Gamma International Educational Society for Most Valuable Member, and the Morton Bender Prize for Outstanding Research. After earning her Bachelor's of Science and Master's of Science degree from the illustrious Clark Atlanta University, she went on to earn a PhD in Applied Mathematics and Scientific Computation from the University of Maryland. Dr. Jackson, through your work, your honors, and your scholarly activities that provide real solutions to medical problems, I want you to know that Clark Atlanta University is extremely proud of you. 
and, uh, and you have honored us through your professional achievements and your many accolades. On behalf of the Association for Women in Mathematics and Clark Atlanta University, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the AWM Research Symposium. Welcome and thank you. so much for that. I can't tell you all how special it is for me to be here back in my alma mater at Clark Atlanta University mm -hmm. to be invited by the Association of Women in Mathematics to, to give this talk which is so instrumental in my early careers but to have the provost of Clark Atlanta University introduce me uh, it was such an honor I'm in my I think when I was an undergrad here I didn't know what a provost did but <laughs> Now I am a deputy provost. I know full well how busy <laughs> you are. And this is not part of your job description, I know that. So I just definitely appreciate you doing that introduction and welcome me back here along with the other administrators here at Clark Atlanta University. So thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, so I said, this is a, a super special moment for me um, coming back home to Clark Atlanta. So I want to go down memory lane a little bit before I actually begin my presentation. So I'm going to show you some slides. For one, that's me when I graduated from, I graduated in 92 and 94 with my bachelor's and master's in Clark Atlanta. And I did not know then the impact this university was going to have on me. And I met many friends along the way here that I've, that I've kept through the years. But last week was super special because MathFest was also here at Clark Atlanta University. And in that photo you have there, that's Reverend Norris, my very first math professor that I had here at Clark Atlanta University. And he got to meet my mother for the first time here. And so we were able to share stories and things that were going on. Uh, so remember, back in the time when I was here, 30-something years ago at, at Clark Atlanta, you know, we didn't have you know, cell phones, internet. We weren't posting your life you know, on social media. So my mother had no idea what was happening with me. You know, back then, your parents dropped you off. They expected you to come back with a degree. You know, <laughs> that was it. And so I had a lot of experiences we got, got to share. And I got to tell one quick story, Reverend Norris, that I, that I love with him. He, when I came to Clark Atlanta, again, I was 18, 19 years old, we had to take a math placement test. And I love math. I know it's going to be a math major. It's going to do math. Well, I was in Georgia. It was like 90 degrees. We were in a building that had no air and windows were shut. I fell asleep during the test. <laughs> so, so I failed it. And so I got placed in remedial math. And so, Go up to the chair and tell them, like, no, no, I know math. They're like, uh, looking at my test course, no, you got to start remedial math. I went and told saw Reverend Norris, and, and I told him, I promise you I can do math. He's like, if you tell me you can do it, you can do it. He let me sit in on his class. And so that was like the very first experience I had that kind of solidified my, my love for math and just, you know, someone just deeply believing in, in me. So I'm grateful. I don't know if he's here or not. He's probably listening um, here, but thank you, Reverend Norris. And then I keep mentioning here, the community here is so connected. I made a lot of friends here. So um, in the picture there, you see some of my AU math friends. So well, the one with me is Dr. Hal, who's um, from Morehouse College and also one of my collaborators um, now. And we've written a book together most recently. Also faculty at American University. And then you may recognize some of the women in the other photo who are actually here today. You see Leona Harris up here from Spelman College, Cherie Whitaker in there. Um, Kim Sellers is not from um, Land University Center, but we consider her honorary because she's deeply involved in the, in the math community there. And this, you heard Dr. Washington mention um, her favorite instructor being Dr. Shabazz. Well, that's Dr. Shabazz in that picture. And the unique thing with this photo is that he was chair when I was at Clark Atlanta. And one thing with Dr. Shabazz, he really made sure that we all were grounded in math and made sure we were making great decisions about where we were gonna go after we left Clark Atlanta. So much so that when I decided to go to University of Maryland after Clark Atlanta, there were three of us that were going. He actually called up the chair of the department at the time and said, hey, I'm sitting these three students. I wanna be sure you're looking out for them. And he literally stayed connected with us um, the entire time, checking in with the department. And then to my surprise, he showed up at my graduation from University of Maryland. I had no clue he was going to be there. 
And again, you gotta think back to the time. The, didn't have a cell phone, I didn't, wasn't able to tell him, he literally just showed up at my graduation, so. To say the Clark Atlanta University faculty like really, really, you know, make sure we're okay is a, is a understatement there. And on that picture, the baby in the picture, I say that's my nephew in the picture. That's actually Kim Seller's son uh, from the previous picture. She's the department head at NC State, but he's a grown man at this point um, at Hampton University. Now the connection with the University of Maryland AWM at the time when I was at University of Maryland was very unique and strong. At the time, AWM was actually headquartered at University of Maryland. So they gave us all, the students there, free memberships. And I fully took advantage of that and a lot of the other students there. And they were sending us to conferences and providing mentorship for us. And so that part was extra special. And the unique thing with that, one of the conferences that AWM sponsored me to attend was the joint math meetings that were actually here in Atlanta in 2005. And it was there that I met Mary Gray. And I don't know if you all have heard of Mary Gray, but she is the found, one of the founding members of AWM. And she was the very first president of AWM. And she's the one who actually brought me to American University. And when I met Mary Gray, it was, again, it was at a banquet at one of the, at the joint math meetings. And I remember I sat next to her and, and we were, you know, talking about my career plans. I was like, well, on Monday, I'm about to accept this job in, in California. I'm really excited. And she was like, well, why don't you come interview with us real quick? And I was like, <laughs> well, like it's, it's Thursday. I'm going to accept the job on Monday, <laughs> you know. She was like, well, just come. Come on Monday, <laughs> you know. So I did. I was like, you know, grad student, free trip. Okay, I'll go. You know, I had a lot of friends in the area, so I went. And literally, I had the most amazing experience on American University's campus. And literally by noon that day, she had made me a written offer that I accepted. Um, and I ended up changing my plans and ended up at American University. So it's just weird how synergies like that work on there. And then you recognize the woman in the other photo, Dr. Washington. So I have known her for a very, very long time. So I told her I would not tell any of our stories from grad school, but <laughs> I will just say I am super proud of you. And I think back when we were in grad school that I don't think either one of us thought of our career path would be this directory at all, you know. I think our biggest goal then was we wanted to graduate. That was it. We didn't think past, and that was an amazing milestone. So to see you as president of this organization, I'm very proud of you. <laughs> okay, so now I'll get to my talk, what I came to talk about. So it's a little bit about me, and it's, I'll start a little bit about me, about my background and my work, and I'll talk to you about the why I do spatial stats and, and what it means. And then I'll go through one of my research problems that I've worked on in this field and, and show you some applications of my work. Okay, so to start, my background um, has come from a lot of ways. So I have worked in industry, I've done internships in industry, I've done sabbaticals at the National Cancer Institute, worked at UCLA, I did a postdoc at Emory University. I think all of those experiences kind of shape my, my love for studying um, public health research and, and diseases. And so my background is focused on a more theoretical way of detecting disease. I develop mathematical models that detect diseases, then I apply them to applications. So what actually is disease surveillance? So I study global trends in diseases. And I don't look so much at infectious diseases. I look more at spatially correlated diseases. So, for example, COVID is a you know an infectious disease. So, if, you know, or a cold and flu. So, if someone in here, say, is sick and they cough, the people around you are more likely to get sick than those further away. That would be a spatial trend. I study diseases more like cancers things. So, for example. If you look at cancer rates in the United States, particularly if we looked at skin cancer rates in the United States, skin cancer rates on the West Coast are by far higher than they are see, on the East Coast. A lot of studies have been done about that. One big reason, um, or like for example in California, is that people spend a lot more time outside. The weather is beautiful for a lot, more t a lot greater time of the year. Um, they, they, have, they exercise more out there than on the East Coast. Again, we have a lot, you know, it snows and the weather gets cold. And we know that the sun is a correlate for skin cancer. So because of that, you will see these global trends happening there. 
So that's the kind of diseases that, that I study. Not so much infectious diseases, but the diseases you get because of where you live. And with the goal being of studying these diseases, to be able to predict the patterns that they have so that you can plan for the future, as, such as developing medical facilities or, or treatments for diseases. Okay, so let me go through and explain to you what spatial data actually are. So in this map I have of North Carolina, it's divided into its 100 counties. The, the data sets that I study that are spatial, um, spatial data sets are data that are on a lattice like this. So I have to find a region, divide it into subregion, and then for each of those regions I have some sort of count. So, each region would have a number of people that have cancer, the number of people that woke up sick, or number of people, or some type of rate there. And the idea being that those counties or regions closer together are more alike than those that are farther apart. Um, you think about a map, say, of Georgia. You know, Georgia's known for their peaches, it's the soil that's ripe here, so if you were to plant fruit here, you expect the same yield, close yield if you planted the fruit in a you know, in, in Fulton County, is a further out county. But the growth should look nothing like if you planted in my hometown, say, of Missouri. That's what spatial data on a lattice look like, and that's the particular type of data that I actually study. Now, one thing well, you're gonna hear me talk a lot about, because I deal with spatial data and relationships matter, the neighborhood structure matters a lot. So, in all of my spatial studies, I have to determine what actually constitutes a neighbor and what a neighbor actually looks like. A lot of times in spatial studies, we define neighbor as a distance. So you may look like you're considered a neighbor of me if you're a certain miles apart. But there are a lot of ways to define a neighbor, and I'm gonna go through a couple of those. So the first thing in beginning a spatial study, you have to make what's called this weight matrix, this neighborhood weight matrix. So in this map, this is a map of, of Western Africa, and this is based on a study I did a, a little while ago where we were looking at malaria mortality rates in Africa. So malaria worldwide is the leading cause of, of death worldwide, and there's been a lot of research on this that is correlated with, um, with, with climate, um, particularly with the change in growth of mosquitoes because of global warming. So there's been research on that, and I did a study where I actually looked at that as well. So to begin a spatial study, you make the weight, weight matrix that I have here, where I just have the 10 counties that I was interested in, which are the ones highlighted in blue, across the top and in the, in the bottom, the rows and the column. The diagonal is zero because I don't need to find a neighbor there. And then you define in the other um, cells what your neighborhood structure actually looks like. So I'm gonna show you one, the study I did. I did an adjacency matrix. And you find in my neighbor this way, if you look just at Senegal, the only country that touches Senegal is Mali, so I have a one in that cell, and the rest of that top row is zero for that reason. So you go through that for the whole entire area that you're studying to create this neighborhood uh, neighbor adjacency matrix. Now, in this type of weight matrix, I only need to do the, the top or the bottom part of the diagonal because it's a symmetric matrix. But in other types of neighbor dependency, that may not be the case. So let's go through this one. This is another popular one. This is a, um, a distance one that's based on a Euclidean distance. And so I have, I'm keeping the Euclidean distance but I also have a scale factor for that Ki where I could offset that distance if I wanted to. And so the, D, the K is just can be a constant there. So in this way, I could define you as my neighbor if you were a certain distance away from me, and I could minimize your impact the further away that you are from me with this equation. So it would be a gradual decline on your impact on me on this one. So this is another popular one that's done. The population density weight matrix, this is one that's not commonly used because it gets more complex on how to use it, but it, it's, it's generally not going to be a symmetric weight function when you use this one. This is one that takes in consideration your actual neighbors that are around you and how many people are around you. So an example would be if you think about New York City. If there were an epidemic or a pandemic in 
New York City. Neighboring areas would be impacted by that because a lot of times people who live in rural areas or smaller areas will travel to bigger urban areas for entertainment or other resources that they need. But the reverse doesn't happen all the time. So someone who lives um, in Poughkeepsie, New York, or Rochester, New York may go into the city. More often, someone who lives in New York City actually goes to those areas. So you can define this population density matrix that takes that into consideration, that if I'm in an area that is an urban area with a large population, it minimizes the impact that smaller regions around me would have. Yet smaller regions that are there, they will be impacted more by the larger regions. So it's not a symmetric weight function, and the smaller rural areas will have a much wider or by far more um, in neighbors uh, impacted. Okay, so there are a lot of issues with this in a spatial study. So for example, you heard me talk about distance. I said I use Euclidean distance. If you're doing a real study, Euclidean distance kind of maps the way that, that you know, a bird would fly. We don't travel that way. So it's not a really accurate distance. If you're looking at small areas, then, then maybe you know, the air is not too bad. But if you're looking at how someone might travel a really long distance, it, it's probably going to be way, way off. So it's not the best distance. You could use an arc length instead. Again, more complicated to compute. You could use a city block distance, but again, still not accurate. It doesn't take into consideration, say, you know, traffic or, you know, or maybe if you even took the train or, or things like that. But the big thing with spatial analysis, this initial part is the most important part of the study. You get different results depending on how you actually define your neighborhood structure. Uh, this map that I have on this picture, this is, again, made up a region, and again, to show you how I do studies, another big issue that happens. In this map, you have to determine, if you're going to use distances, what are you measuring, and where are you measuring it? So I generally use the centroids. So if I'll take a region, I'll find the most center point, and I'll calculate distances that way. That's one way to do it. However, you, you could take borders if you want, if I can go back to the map I did of Africa, oh, Bali's huge. And so choosing that center point versus choosing one of the points on the border, you get very different results doing that. So you do have to choose early on how you're even going to measure your distances if you try to use distances in your equation zone at all. OK, so where do I actually get the data that I study? I mentioned I study, most of the time, I, I study a lot of cancer data sets. So I've, I've studied, like I said, leukemia. I've studied colon cancer, breast cancer, um, head and neck cancers, a lot of different cancers. And I tend to use registries for that. You may not know in this country that if you are diagnosed with certain diseases, such as strokes, heart attacks, or cancers, you're automatically put into a database that, uh, for cancers, is maintained by the National Institute of Health on there. And that's automatic. Your doctor has to put that information in. And researchers have access to that data. And so the public um, has access to one version that doesn't have a lot of detailed information, but researchers can get detailed stuff, such as you know, your gender, your, where you're from, your income, things like that to do analyses with. So that's generally a good data set. And it's one I commonly use. One big flaw in this data set, particularly with cancers, um, if you're diagnosed with, say, a disease um, such as a cancer, a lot of times people will go and get a second opinion, you know, and they're expected to do that. Well, if you don't tell your doctor you're getting a second opinion, you get put into this database twice. So the data there are not absolutely accurate, but it is one of the better data sets that we have. Um, school absenteeism. That's another early indicator disease set. So for example, if you all have children and they get sick, you know, you'll pull them out of school. In the United States, we have to keep, in the public school, we have to keep track of school attendance. And that can be an early indicator for a lot of children are, are not going to school that maybe something's going on in the environment that's making them sick there. Emergency room data is the same way. That's a good one as well. That's, again, that will show you signs of um, probably more advanced disease. But the bad thing with emergency room data, and I've, I've tried analyzing before, is that they're messy. Because again, when there's a, a critical event happening or, or a trauma that's happening, no one's really concerned about they're making sure that they wrote the right decimal place in the right form in the right field. 
And so you have to do a lot of cleaning of these data sets if you're going to use those. Um, OTC is over-the-counter medication. So um, all, all of you know by now, if you go to grocery stores or you go to drug stores, Walgreens, CVS, they want your phone number. You get heavy discounts by doing that. Those are data sets that researchers have access to, to, to actually study. And again, that's because they're, they're good data sets for early indicator disease because a lot of times when you're sick, you don't call your doctor first thing. You know, you go to a drugstore, you buy something. So sales of certain medications are, are actually tracked there. So particularly um, like Tylenols and, and acids, things like that are tracked. One interesting story about over-the-counter medicine, when I was at Emory University, the, the researchers there were working with um, the health department there and looking at over-the-counter medicines. And there was um, one day, the example they gave me was when they were studying, there was a spike in sales of Pepto-Bismol. This was after 9-11, and it was the day after the, the Super Bowl. And so everyone was on high alert around that time because you know, everyone thought that you know, maybe something got released into the environment, maybe it was a bioterrorism event. After they studied that data set for a long time, they realized that during that Super Bowl, that was the one that's Miss Janet Jackson, Justin Timberlake Super Bowl, Pepto-Bismol aired a coupon right after that. So everyone saw it <laughs> there and uh, buying it. <laughs> so you can get a false alarm in studying over-the-counter medicines. And that's like Halloween, too. There's a huge uptick in sales of antacids and, and Pepto-Bismol after Halloween. So you have to ignore things like that. But again, it's a better, it's an early indicator data set than some of the other ones that are available. OK, so pandemic versus epidemic, so what it actually looks like. This is a made up picture that I'm showing. So on the x-axis, I have time. And on the y-axis, I have occurrence of disease. What we see in disease surveillance is the, the, the lower curve, the bottom one first. You see a group of people that get sick all of a sudden, but then all of a sudden they get better. And there are no red flags or no signals on there because, again, they get better, even though we may not know what the disease is at the time. What sends the red flag is when there's a second group that gets really sick much quicker and then they get better, which is what happened with COVID-19 when it became a pandemic there. So a lot of diseases that I study, we look at spatial and temporal trends to figure out when they actually symbolize that they're going to be a pandemic versus a, an epidemic. Okay, so again, I keep focusing on my work depends on relationships on your neighborhood structures, on the correlation. So what actually am I looking at? Again, here's another made up map, but I wanna focus on showing you what a positive spatial autocorrelation looks like. So I'm looking for clusters or trends in diseases. So in a positive autocorrelation, I'm looking to see that high values are near high values and low values are near low values. And that's what's happening in this map. You see the reds are really close to the reds, those would be a cluster, and the greens are close to the green. Now this is an exaggerated positive correlation that we would find in my studies. And I developed statistics that actually can detect that. This is what a negative spatial autocorrelation actually looks like. You have the opposite that happens. You have high values and there are low values, and you still have intermediate values or immediate values, and then the vice versa, low near the high values. And again, this is a negative spatial autocorrelation that we have to take that can detect those. The other alternative that can happen is no correlation at all, and it's just a random trend, just a random, and that's generally most disease data sets that you would study that could use the regular stat methods, so would be that. Okay, so I'm gonna go over some real examples that I use some data sets that I've used, and I forgot my legend on, on this one. But this is HIV mortality rates in the United States. And as you see here, there's a clear global pattern happening. The red are the high values, the blue are the low values. And so you see the reds are super high along the coast, and then as you go up north, it goes a lot lower. In my work, I can find these trends but I work with other researchers to find out why the trends are actually happening. And this is one that's been studied a lot, and no one has figured out why that trend is actually there for that one. Here's an, another one. This is lung cancer rates, and these are mortality rates. And this is in 1950. 
And Linda Pickle, who was at in a, um, NIH when I was there, did a lot of work on this data set. Again, you see a huge trend happening, a huge global trend happening. So the high rates, again, are in the south. Then as you go up north, the rates get a lot lower. The reason that was found behind that one is because during this time frame, there were a lot of pollution plants along the coast. Because again, because we use our waterways to transport goods and things, so the plants were built near the coast. Well, these plants are giving off smokes that were toxic to the lungs and they were causing lung cancer. Um, so things have changed since then. There's more protection around these plants. We don't have as many of those anymore. But another example, if you pull out Montana, there's actually a cluster that happened in Montana. There's one county that if you pull it out, it's much higher than its surrounding counties. That's again a spatial analysis or, or a spatial autocorrelation that happened. And that one, there was a plant literally in that county which was causing those higher rates there. So this is another a project that I worked on, again, when I was at National Cancer Institute. Uh, when I was there, we were studying breast cancer. And screenings for breast cancer for women should be, if you adhere to government regulations, um, over the age of 40 every two years. So we were studying to see who was following those guidance from the government to get those screenings regularly. One reason we studied California, as I mentioned earlier, health outcomes in California tend to be better than the rest of the United States. And again, that's been known because they're outdoors more, they exercise more, they tend to eat better over there. A lot of things happen in California that make it different than the rest of the, the country. And they actually, in California, I think the, the, the goal rate for the U.S. is to have 80 percent of women to adhere to the guidelines, and they actually exceed that. So that's one reason why we're studying it, to figure out what are some indicators that we could use in the rest of the country, or what should California do to even raise those rates even more. So I'm not presenting the whole study here, but we made this spatial map where we actually looked at the mammography screening rates in California. And I work with a team of researchers. Like I said, in my work, I can find the trends, I can find the mathematics, but I don't know what they're based on. Well, I had some of my group that um, we ended up overlaying the rural versus urban area map, which is what this first map here is. If you put that on top of there, those high rates coincide directly with um, the high screening rates for mammography screening rates in California. So that was one relationship that we found. But the really interesting thing that happened when I was at NIH, we, I, I had maps all over my office when, when I was there. I had that map posted and someone walked by and they happened to notice um, that the dark spots also lined up with the highways in California. And so we overlaid a highway to look at that and we did some statistical analysis and found that it's actually true. And so what we realized that because black in California, because there's not a lot of public transportation, traffic can be difficult there, women will go get screened if you put a facility near a highway there. So put a facility near a highway and in an urban area actually raise mammography screening rates in California. So that's kind of how when I make these maps, how I work with other researchers to figure out what these trends actually mean. The next few slides are a study that I did looking at um, colorectal cancer. So colorectal cancer is the third, is, has the third highest mortality rates in the United States. It impacts women slightly more than men and impacts African Americans by far more than any group. So in this map, we were looking at some of the correlates there for um, colon cancer mortality rates. So in the first one here, this was for Caucasian, and we looked at the rates, and you notice the rate, and we compared it to the national average. So no real difference in the national average for this one. However, when you look at the map that looks at African Americans, you see a real difference in there. African Americans' uh, mortality rates from colorectal cancer are quite much higher than the national average. And you see this global trend that's actually happening there as well. With again, the southern states having a little bit higher rates than the, um, county, the counties in the uh, in, the, in the north. The reason for that, there's been research done that colorectal cancer is directly tied to diets. One thing with colorectal cancer, it's a very slow cancer. So it starts with a polyp. It takes like 10 years for that polyp to develop into something that's cancerous. So as long as you get your regular screenings, it is very much a treatable cancer that can be detected early on. And so with this research, we did a lot of recommendations that the 
the, the screening interval right now for the yes is every 10 years after the age of 50, but for African Americans, it should be much sooner than that, perhaps every five years, um, because the mortality rates are so much higher. In this one, again, we looked at Hispanics, and we did not find any true clusters in this one either. So this is an interesting study that I did with a group of, of students um, early on. We were looking at leukemia mortality rates in the United States. And with leukemia, it was, there's been a lot of conflicting research of um, what causes leukemia, what the treatment, the best treatments are for leukemia. With this study, we, look, we compared to a study that was done, the NIH it did a few years earlier, that said there was direct correlation between um, perhaps where people lived and their, you know, if, if they, um, leukemia, I guess, mortality rates. So here we mapped, here, here, all the locations of nuclear plants in the United States. And at the time here, there were somewhere around 80 nuclear power plants in the U.S. The idea being that families that lived near these plants probably had a higher incidence of leukemia mortality rates. Well, what the students found when we did this analysis was the exact opposite. We did not find a spatial relationship at all from these plants. The interesting thing about that, we looked at other diseases as well around these plants, you know, such as heart attacks and strokes, and also a lot lower. So the theory is now was that the people who live near these plants, they know they live near them. They know that they're at risk for, for being exposed to toxic chemicals and radiation. So they do everything else in their life right. So, you know, they drink a glass of water a day, they eat their vegetables, they don't bungee jump, they wear their seat belts, they, you know, they drive safe, they, everything they have control over in their life, they do right. And they end up developing these very healthy, strong bodies that can withstand other diseases. And so they end up having better health outcomes, which is why we didn't see the trends that we're expected to see here in this map. So those are just a few of the spatial analysis studies that I've done. But why this is actually important, like why go through the steps of making sure your data does or does not have a spatial trend is important. If you use regular stat methods and you don't, do, and you don't assess if you have a spatial trend, if you're doing geographical studies, you'll get the wrong answers and won't know it at all. A lot of people, you know, use software, you use R or SPSS or some software that gives you out a number of p-value. Those numbers mean nothing if you don't check all the assumptions beforehand. So if you have a spatial data set that has a spatial trend that's truly as positive or negative spatial autocorrelation and you don't check for it and it's there, you'll end up finding significance when you don't actually have it. And not only that, you'll end up finding a stronger significance level there. So in actuality, you get fooled twice in your results. You end up believing you have a correlation when you don't actually have one, and you actually believe your correlation is stronger than it actually is. So that's why it's so important to do this background work on your data sets if you're looking at geographic data sets, um, such as cancer data sets or the COVID-19 data sets. Okay, so now I'm going to go into one of my research papers that I, I worked on. So I showed you some global trends and local clusters, what they actually look like on a map. I want to talk you through some of the common methods that we use to actually detect these global clustering patterns. I'm going to talk to you about two of them, Baranzai and IPOP, that have been around for quite a long time, and they're primarily the gold standard what we use. But I'm also going to talk about one that I developed that I called modified Moranzi that's being used quite a bit now. Okay, so IPOP. This is a global spatial statistic that's used to detect global clustering patterns. And so it's not as complicated an equation as it looks. But the one thing that sets this one apart than every other statistic that's out there is that it takes in consideration homogeneity in well, heterogeneity in populations. So all the other statistics don't take that into consideration when it's trying to determine if there's a cluster. That's really important, especially if you're studying regions like the United States that's divided into its, its 3,000 counties. Because what happens is, let's go back to the registries. I talked to you, I get my data sets from registries. Let's say I end up, you know, looking at a region 
a rural area that has a very small population that's next to an urban area that has a high population. I mentioned also that happens in these data sets. A lot of times people will get second opinions and may not tell their doctors and it impacts the data set. Well, someone's diagnosed to say with a cancer in an urban area, um, whether they get a second opinion there in an urban or not, one count won't change the rates much. But if they move to a rural area, it can change the counts quite a bit. So you'll get these spillover effects and you have, you'll have clusters where they don't truly exist. It's just one person or a few people shifting the numbers a bit. That's what this statistic is good for. It takes into consideration that the populations in the counties can vary quite a bit, and that population could be the confounding factor that symbolizes a cluster when whether or not there is one there. This is Moran Zyg, another popular one that's been around a while. Um, the one thing with Moran I does, if you look at the equation, the I's represent the, my location of interest. The J's represent my neighbors. So it looks at your deviation from the means, from my central location that I'm looking at and all of the neighbors. And it offsets it by the weight function that you choose. So that's why I said earlier, how you define a weight function is very, very important. You will get different results depending on that weight function that you are using there. And so if you look, so Moranti also includes the standard, the deviation that's denoted by that SY squared. I'm pointing that out because I'm gonna modify that equation. So I wanna rewrite Moran's I just as the top equation that I have there. So therefore, now I can um, just write it simply as the, the bottom one that I have here. So I just, just did a substitution there. I did that because I wanna show you what I did with modified Moran's I. So I mentioned earlier that Moran's I, the original equation, it looks at the difference from the mean and, and each location from its neighbors modified with the weight function. Well, it makes sense to say if you think the means are impacted by the weight functions, weight functions the standard deviations should actually be impacted as well. So therefore, we modified Moran's I to recalculate that standard deviation to account for the weight function the way Moran's I does for the actual means. And in doing so, again, making that substitution, I, I'm leaving out a lot of the details, but in making that substitution, I can now re-express modified Moran's I as this equation. Uh, you can't see it there so much, but now the mean is impacted by the weight function as well as standard deviation. So we did, we proved that theoretically how it works. I'm gonna show you the graphical ways that, what I did for this equation. So we, we simulated global clustering patterns. So at the beginning of my talk, I showed you a lot of different types of clustering patterns, what they look like from the leukemia one, the breast cancer ones. So in this map, I, I made up a pattern. I wanted to know where the clusters actually were. So the map of the United States, I forced a cluster or an outbreak to happen in a certain percent of the population. So the smallest ones with 5%, then there's 10, and the 15, uh, then 20, I think the last one I put 30% of the population. And then in the other map, I, I simulated this global trend where I wanted to first mimic on the bottom <clears throat> just um, a gradient effect from west to the east where the the rates start out low and then they get higher as you go to the east. In the top one, I did this spiral effect to say if something happened in the central United States and then spread out to the coast. So just different global patterns and I wanted to see which of these methods actually worked the best. Okay, so here are my results that I have here. And so let me walk you through how to actually look at this. Let's look just at the, the top part. So to compare the results, I want to compare modify Moran's I with Moran's I and IPOP. But again, I keep saying you got to compare weight functions together. So as you read this chart, look at every other one. So look at the first one, modify Moran's I with the ADJ, look at Moran's I with ADJ, and IPOP with ADJ. Inside the cells, those, that's the power. So the, the percent of time you, would, you will detect a true cluster given that there's one there. So you want the power to be high. 
the ranges that I have here, the 5, 10, 15, 20, and 30, that refers to the maps that I simulated over here with the different, um, different cluster size based on the population. And now let's look at the power. Modify Marin's eye, if you look at the, the smaller population, particularly between 5 and 20, it has a higher power than Marin's eye and IPOP for the adjacent weight functions. And especially for a small cluster, for the 5, it's significantly higher than IPOP and Marin's eye. Interesting what happens when you get to the larger ones, when we have, say, 30% of the population. Again, that's a huge cluster. Again, I mean, you can see that even just with the naked eye, just looking at the map. All the statistics do very well in pretty much in detecting that one. Let's move to the population density weight function that we use instead. So again, modified Moran's eye does perform better than the other statistics. Again, it's, there's not as big a difference, and that's because, again, in the beginning, the population density weight matrices have a lot more information than the adjacency weight ones. So for the, using the adjacency weight function, you're only going to have between 1 and 12 neighbors um, in the U.S. That, that's the biggest you have for using counties. With the population density, you can have hundreds are in there. So the more neighborhood information that I have in spatial studies, the better they are. So that's why for using those, the population density weight function, it's not as critical as, as to which method that you actually use. Let's look at the bottom one that has the spatial and the, the spiral trend and, and the linear trends that have here. Again, those are big global trends, but let's look at the adjacent weight function. So the very first column, the third column, and the fifth column that I have here. So again, my modified Marantz I was able to detect those global trends better than the other statistics. And remember, all that I did in then modifying was I made sure that the variance included the weight function, just like the, the numerator of Marantz I did as well. And that's the case also with both those trends, the spiral and the linear trend that I have here. I had higher power than, than the other ones. Um, so in this, in this um, paper, we also did an application area. You can't tell on this map, but this is central New York divided into its county. It's a known, there was a known cluster of leukemia rates that were happening in these counties. So we ran Moran's eye and my modified Moran's eye and IPOP to see which one could actually detect that global cluster, that cluster that was actually happening there. And as you see, I have the p-values there. All of them were able to detect it, but modified Moran's eye was able to detect it with the, with the smallest p-value on there. So that's an overview of kind of the work that I've been doing. Um, so Mitch, I study other diseases as well, but the, the methods that I have don't just apply to diseases. They uh, apply to any field. The spatial stats method actually got first developed to study land plots. Um, Fisher is known as the founder of statistics, used spatial methods to figure out how to do a study to determine which fertilizers you should use to plant in a field to get the best growth from crop. So he did the first study that used the first spatial methods, but I happen to apply mine to diseases. Here are a few of the papers that I've referenced in this talk if you want more information about that. I can share that with you. And then I have to mention um, a book that, that I've written with Dr. Howell and Dr. Gracinger that was here and Dr. Virchiano. I don't know if he, they're both still here today. We did a talk on it earlier or yesterday, I'm part of um, this meeting. And we're very proud, we call this our pandemic book. We wrote it during the pandemic, but we pulled in a lot of the examples that you saw me present here actually in this book. And it shows a unique way to actually teach statistics to people that have very little background in statistics where we actually use a lot of our programming actually to do it. And then I want to mention also my REU that, that I've been running for several years along with, with Dr. Howe. I mentioned it earlier. When, when I first came to Clark Atlanta as a sophomore, I got accepted into a research experience program for undergraduate. No clue what research was. They just knew they were, they were paying me 400 a week, you know, so I was like, I was going to do it <laughs> there. I fell in love with research at that. I had my first publication then. That solidified my career to want to be a researcher. So when I say I owe Clark Atlanta a lot for getting to me where I am today, it, I, I really do. And so, and so another full circle moment for me now is that I give back to students that way 
by running these RAUs. And so we've had over 200 students in the program over 22 years. And we, we just finished our, an RAU this just past summer when we brought a student here to MathFest just last week to present um, most recent research a project we worked on. So if you have students that are interested, please let them know um, about this. But uh, well, that's it. Well, thank you all. I appreciate your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Jackson, for that informative keynote. Uh, if you want to share it with your family or friends, it is on our YouTube channel, the AWM YouTube, so you can watch it later. Thank you. It's a Thank fantastic you. presentation. Thank you. <laughs> she will be around if you'd like to uh, talk with her and ask some questions. At this time, we're going to transition to our panel, which will start at 1130 and it will be on math research in government and government labs. Then we'll take a quick lunch break and then have a community roundtable on AWM's policy and advocacy priorities. Actually, your priorities. So.